Dear people of God, the passage that we read in 1 Thessalonians 2 ties in with the theme of growing. We continue that theme, which was introduced last week at our anniversary, as we were reminded that we are to still grow in the grace of God. But you know, I thought this Sunday, well, we could look back and say that was all wonderful last week, and it was a, a good theme for our anniversary celebration, but now let's just sort of set that behind us and let us think of something else exciting and uh, uh, captivating that we can go on to study in God's Word. That would be okay. But you know, there's so much more to that topic of continuing to grow in God's grace. We were reminded last week that we are to grow in proper thinking and in godly action. But how do we do that? And what are some of the components of growing in that grace? And can we pause with that theme for a little while and make some more application to our lives? And it's entirely appropriate to do that, so let, let's look at this passage. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. That's Paul and Silas and Timothy, three evangelists writing to the church of Thessalonica, to the Christians there, saying this is what we're encouraging you to do. This is what we're urging you to do. And that has powerful implications and application with regard to growing in God's grace. And it's timely for us to think about that right now as a congregation. We're looking at validating the names of office bearers, uh, affirming the names of office bearers uh, to complete the slate of our church council. And in many ways, the office bearers that God will be putting in place over Grace Christian Reformed Church will continue that task that Paul and Silas and Timothy had to urge and encourage the family of God to grow in the grace of God and to live godly lives. So how will we do that? How will church council encourage that kind of spiritual growth and spiritual discipline at Grace Church? It's also a time in which we focus on education. Our Church school programs are kind of winding down, but we focus on what our children have been taught. Church school graduation is coming up this month. School graduations are happening. College and university students are out for the summer or maybe completed their program altogether. High school and grade school students will complete their year of study next month. And all of that helps us to focus on that question, so what do, we really, what do we really do in education? Not just in the school systems, but what do we do in education in the church and in the homes? How are we training our children to grow in the grace of God on a daily, weekly, yearly basis? Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Next month, Father's Day is coming up. As mothers and fathers, as grandmothers and grandfathers, and just as members of the church, how do we in our families encourage that growth? Well, this passage that we've looked at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 has a powerful message for all of us in all of these areas as the church prays and works for growth. The Christian parenting imagery of the church leaders stands front and center in this passage. Paul and Silas and Timothy, uh, they use the imagery of the mother. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. And we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul and Silas and Timothy don't see themselves as strangers. They didn't just come in as people from outside, but they saw themselves as part of the family, and they had an instinct, 
a mothering nurture for the church. And they said, this, this is how we lived with you. We embraced you. We took you close to our heart, and we nurtured you with God's word. A powerful image for the church. Not only that, they use father image as well. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Um, the implication in that is we want you to live lives that are right. We want you to make good choices. We want you to live in a way that's honorable, that's wise, that's respectable, that, that's helpful, that will glorify God. We trained you, we, we encouraged you, we nurtured you in that way. But notice in this passage in verse 1 as well as in verse 9, there's other imagery that's used. Brothers and sisters. That's how they address them. Brothers and sisters. Verse 9, they repeat that as brothers and sisters. And so it's not authoritarian. It's not as if they're above the other members of the church. They recognize we're all brothers and sisters together. We're all encouraging each other. We're, we're, we have different gifts and different roles and different responsibilities, but we're brothers and sisters together. We're part of this family together. Now, that, that people of God has a powerful application in terms of how the church functions, how the church grows, how the church grows in grace. And, of course, it also has implications for our families. When the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy take the image of the family, the ideal image of the family, the desired way that families would function, and use that as an illustration for how leaders in the church and members of the church should function together, it says something about the church and how the church grows, and it says something about the families and how families should grow. And so we make that application this morning in both areas. They emphasize caring, but it's a distinct kind of caring. The Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy realize that within this family, it's the family of God. And they recognize that there's some, something natural about mothers caring for their children and fathers caring for their children and nurturing their children. And of course, there are exceptions. There are abnormalities. There are anomalies. But they're not what's, quote, normal. There are mothers that neglect their children. There are fathers that abuse their children. And everybody knows in their heart that's not the way it ought to be. Parents ought to care for their children. They ought to love them and nurture them. If you look at the animal world, there are some animals and some species that nurture their young, and there are some that bring them into this world and they just abandon them. That's the animal world. That's not normal for human beings. Human beings ought to care, ought to nurture, ought to have that God-given desire to raise and, and, and train and encourage. That's true of people in general. But now you bring that into the Christian community. You bring it into those who are followers of Jesus Christ, parents who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, children who are brought into those families as the gift of God and recognized as such, children that are part of the covenant. And then there's a distinct kind of caring, Christian caring, because we realize that this is not just a natural bond. It's not just a normal human instinct. It's a God-given privilege. 
It's a God-given privilege to be a part of the family of God and to receive children and, and grandchildren and great-grandchildren from God and, and to care for them and nurture them and train them so that they are valued and treasured and precious so that they develop the gifts that God has given to them so that they live in such a way that they will know God and love God and honor him. That's a privilege. And that's a privilege that God gives to the church to all of the members of the church, whether they're biological parents or not biological parents. They're part of that family of believers. We're all part of that. And council members care for the members of the church, elders and deacons and pastoral care workers and pastors care like mothers and fathers. But it doesn't stop there. Everybody in the church is a brother and a sister to each other. Everybody in the church is an uncle or an aunt or a, a sibling or whatever in that spiritual language sharing the care and the nurture of the body of Christ. This family is called to excel in encouragement. Did you know, those of us who were parents can probably relate to this. But if you're not a parent, you're a child. You were a child, and to some extent, you remain a child all of your life, right? We've all had parents. There's a rule of thumb. Probably for every word of criticism or every sentence of criticism and critique, it would be helpful for us to have 10 words of encouragement, 10 sentences of encouragement. The reality is that within our families, within our relationships with each other, encouragement will set the context for growth. Growth doesn't happen, typically. Growth doesn't happen, first of all, through criticism, but through encouragement. If what we hear most of all is criticism, we put up walls. If most of what we hear is encouragement, we're receptive to correction. It's true in parenting. You want to be a an effective parent? Do you want to be a, a powerful, godly parent directing your children? Make sure that you set a context of encouragement within your home. Encourage your children, love them, build them up, make them secure, make them realize that they are loved and treasured and valued. Express 10 sentences of encouragement for each one of correction, and your children will receive and accept the correction. You know, it's remarkable. When the apostles write, when, the, when Paul and Silas and Timothy and Peter write to the church, at times they need to correct. They need to set things straight but they ordinarily set the context with encouragement, with a gentle heart, with a prayerful attitude, encouraging the members of the body of Christ. We're called to give comfort. The situation in Thessalonica was in some ways a bit unique. The apostles had gone there briefly. They had preached the gospel. A number of people had believed, most of them of non-Jewish background, and they became part of the church. They accepted the gospel of salvation, but persecution set in, and there was terrific and horrific opposition. And in that context, they, they wrote them to comfort them. And the Apostle Paul writes that we ought to comfort each other with the kind of comfort that we've already received, knowing that God is our Lord and Savior, that God is gracious, that our lives are, are in his care. The Apostle Paul didn't write Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 1, 
what is your only comfort in life and in death. But the writers of the Catechism echoed what Paul and the other apostles wrote. What's the only comfort? That realization, that, that delightful realization to know that we belong to our heavenly Father and to know that nothing, nothing in all of creation can separate us from his care. That in life and in death, we belong to a faithful Savior. That's comfort. Circumstances change, but people of God, we, each and every one of us, need comfort. We need comfort on a daily basis. We need the comfort of knowing that we are accepted by God, that we are loved and treasured by him. We need the comfort of knowing that with all of the challenges of the world in which we live, God still values us and treasures us, and he, he preserves our future. He loves us, and he's not letting us go. We need to hear that in God's word. We need to hear the Holy Spirit whisper that in our ear, but we also need to hear it from each other, saying to each other, you know what? I understand that there's some difficult circumstances in your life right now, but God cares. God loves you. God's not giving up on you. God's not turning his back on you. Don't give up on God, because... He loves you dearly. The family of God comforts. And finally, education. Paul and Silas and Timothy emphasize that the church in Thessalonica is to continue to learn. They are to grow. They are to dig deep into the word of God and continue to build on the foundation that the apostles had laid. They were there only briefly. They gave them the outline of salvation. They gave them the basic knowledge of the Lord and Savior, but they were given the opportunity to continue to build on that. Do you know that's our responsibility in our families as well, in our homes, in church, in our education systems, to continue to educate everyone as we grow in the knowledge of God. Statistics Canada suggests that each year, each year in Canada, more than $50 billion is spent on education in grade schools and high schools. $50 billion. The reality is that all the money in the world, all the money in the world, cannot necessarily buy the kind of education that Paul and Silas and Timothy are talking about. Because, you see, that's an education that recognizes that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Lord of life. He was there at creation, and he is the first fruit of the new creation, and our lives belong to him, and our lives should be dedicated to his glory, and that is a priceless truth that ought to be communicated. And ideally, that should be communicated to our precious children at home, at church, and at school. Our children belong to their Heavenly Father. So what have we seen this morning? We've seen that it's our goal to encourage growth in all. All of God's children should continue to grow. And we've seen this morning that the family imagery of Thessalonians is still relevant. We're called to treat each other as brothers and sisters. We're called to nurture each other as mothers and to direct and support each other as fathers to their children. Within this family enterprise, the family of God, we're not strangers. We ought not to treat each other as strangers or as outsiders, but we embrace each other as members of the family. And then ideally not, in, not a dysfunctional family, but a family that, that rallies around the love of God and grows in that love, a love that's caring. And we need to care for each other a love that's encouraging. And think of the opportunities that we have every day, but 
As we began this message, we recognize that this is a time in which we select office bearers. Office bearers encourage the members of your family. Family, encourage your office bearers. That's how we grow in grace. Comforting. There are hurts within the family of God. Many of our members have lost loved ones recently. Assure each other of your prayers, your support, your love. We need comfort to have the security to grow in the grace of God. But it's not just the loss of a loved one. It's not necessarily even just the loss of health and um, rather devastating message perhaps from a doctor. It's not just in the context of our physical health. Spiritual comfort. The security to know that, that God genuinely keeps us in his care. And education. Education is ongoing. Education is a privilege. It's a delight. We learn together as we come to God's word in public worship, but... But don't leave it at that. Don't be content to only educate yourself for an hour or two hours on Sunday. Dig into God's word. Build your knowledge of our Savior and his expectations for your life. People of God, these are, these are ways that we will still grow in God's grace together so that we, we may be the people, we may be the family, we can be the church that brings honor to our God and to our Savior. Let's pray together.